if you voted for somebody and you need to break up with them, don't, don't be their friends. And I, I said, well, don't give up a 20-year friendship because somebody voted for somebody you didn't like. And they said, if you voted for somebody, uh, if you voted somebody, they said to me, if you voted for Trump, anybody who votes for Trump, you should cut them off and not be their friend. I said, are you kidding me? I'm not going to give up a 20-year friendship with somebody for somebody's four-year job that I hadn't ate with, prayed with, talked with. I'm, I'm bigger than that. Look at somebody say, I'm bigger than that. Look at four or five people say, I hope you're bigger than that. Don't take it. It's not a ball game. It's not a winner or a loser. We, we, we're, you know, because I like what Ronald Reagan said when he got in the office and the first day in office, he went into the meeting and said, well, I'm not a Republican because he was Republican. He said, I'm not a Republican president. I'm not a Democratic president. I'm the president of the United States. Now there's no more Democrat, Republican. Now there's a, a country and we got to get it running properly. Let's believe that Whatever candidate gets in, that will become their mindset and bridge this gap that we have in this nation. I pray for it right now. I pray the division is getting deeper and deeper. And we here at the Favor Nation, we need to stop it, don't we? We need to bind together and love one another. I don't care who he is or who she is. I care who he is. His name is Jesus. Hallelujah. A couple of things. My shirts are out there. Grab them before I sell them all this week. You can wear them, believe it, receive it, or what? They're $15. Also, the favor shirts, there's a few of them out there. I don't have any mediums or small, but we have uh, uh, other sizes that are out there if you want to get them and wear them at the uh, hunt gallery, the Easter egg hunt. So, favor or this one. And uh, I, and we need to pray for the... Uh, does that look bad right there on TV? Does that look bad? Is that okay? We need to pray for whoever has got it out for me in this church. I went by the Lenore Ryan. We had a big old $200 banner out there by Fuddruckers. Somebody came by and cut it down. Cut that thing up. Yes. I said that. When I drove by, I went, no. Dad, was you with me? You, me, and Richie? I, I, huh? They left all the other banners up. Cut, cut down ours. The devil's afraid of us breaking out into these two services. Woo! High five somebody said, we'll win. I, told, I got on Periscope today, and I got on TV today, and I said, I'm going to do 909 if I'm here by myself. And I said, and that guy who's taking up my signs, I'm praying that God's going to convert you in Jesus' name, and you're going to be a member of the Favor Center. Come on in, Rico. So glad you made it. Yay, Rico. <laughs> I'm preaching tomorrow night in Macon, Georgia, and uh, at a uh, pastor's conference, a minister, a church conference there called the Eagles Gathering. Pop's going with me, so he's going to help me gather the Eagles. Pop Mimi is going with me. And uh, let me turn off your... Uh, Real friends that are kingdom connected wouldn't say that. Well, thank you, Carlos. Appreciate it. Carlos sent me a text. Excuse me, I'm texting him back. Love you. <laughs> no, I'm just turning off this ringer so it don't bing on me. So, <clears throat> got a lot of things coming up. Saturday, when you come to help, we just want to get it before it gets out of control, the weeds and the flower beds. We want the house of God. This is what we deem God's house. We want it to look good. So if you're available to help, Richie will be here. I think Jerry will be here. If you're here, you can come an hour and leave. You don't have to stay the whole time, but if you can come and help us out in any way, please come and be a part. And women and men are welcome. If we get a few guys here, we can get it done in about two or three hours, don't you think? Get it all looking really nice for Easter. And then what we're going to do this time, though, is lay the paper down, weed paper, so we ain't got to worry about it. No weeds will grow after that, right? In Jesus' name. Well, I want to talk to you a little bit about what I talked about today, <clears throat> how to get through rejection, how to lead through rejection, how to survive rejection, lead in rejection if you're a pastor, how to pastor your church through a season of rejection, how to get through a relationship if you've been in a rejection 
uh, through divorce or hurt. Uh, the Bible is packed full of information. And uh, we won't keep you long tonight, but we just want to talk a little bit. I was on Periscope and talked about it. So many people were texting me afterwards saying, I had people just saying, my God, I was crying and weeping because so many people don't know how to get up and move through rejection. You will never succeed in life if you can't stand and walk through a season of rejection. You couldn't be a, you couldn't run for the, you, let's think about this. I know a lot of people hate Donald Trump, but how do you succeed, like, like, how do you become a candidate? You couldn't become a candidate for this country and run for president if you couldn't get through criticism and rejection. Can you, you, you imagine, can you imagine going after something and having a half of America, so many people talking and saying the stuff? We don't say that about anybody, but I guess it's okay to talk like that about someone running for the office of presidents of the, of the United States. You, you wouldn't talk like that, and nowhere in the Bible does God give us permission to trash, talk, or demean anybody, except, I guess it says in the Bible, except for anybody running for presidential office. You can say any mean, harsh, hateful thing you want, but the rest of the time you need to be kind and merciful and gracious. No, we got to, we got to watch how we're attacking Anybody, anybody, look at somebody say, anybody. anybody. And remember, all those people that are running for office are human beings, and one day will die and have to face an eternal God, just like you will. So uh, we want to pray for them all, I mean all of them, Democrat, Republican, all of them, and, uh, and not down any of them. Every, here, this is biblical. This is a pattern I have found in the Bible. This is a pattern. Everyone that God liked, the majority hated. This is a pattern in the Bible. Every time God revealed favor to anybody in the Bible, the next season in their lives became a season of incredible rejection and hurt. Jesus had as many for against him as he had for him. And when it comes time for his greatest moment, he has very few in his corner. And if you're going to be someone who can get through a season of situation, crisis, or attack, you're going to have to learn how to go through attack, Rejection and being alone. Not going to succeed unless you can lead through rejection. Rejection is a, it doesn't even need to be defined, but if you looked up the word rejection, you might want to write it down. It means to refuse something. If I reject you, I refuse it. Or uh, when someone c tries to sell you something and you say uh, and you refuse it, that's rejection. Or another definition is to discard as useless. When when you reject something, you're sending out a vibe or a, a frequency that you feel to you it is useless. Rejection. The word rejection means to cast out or to eject. You're going to have to know that if any time you decide to better your life, if you decide to change, if you decide to start giving, if anything you, you decide to do that's going to better you, you're going to have to be willing to walk through friends who will reject you. I'm not talking to you. Young people, you're going to have to learn that rejection is something that we learn through I would say conditional response. We watch TV and we learn that there's two kinds of rejection on the earth. There's the art of rejection and then there's rejection of art. And I'll explain that in a minute. I've been through many seasons of rejections. I'll tell you, you when you're married, you have to learn how to weather rejection with a spouse because not all the time does a spouse make you feel welcome. In your life, in success, 
you're going to learn that rejection has the, these kinds of feelings. Number one, when you're going through a season of rejection, you're going to feel that you're in a desolate place. Now, I, I want to I preface this before I give you some of these keys on, on what this place is like. You're going to learn that God is using rejection for something else. So in this, in this feeling of place, rejection makes you feel like you're in a desolate place. I've been there. I know what it's like with the, to start a church and you start growing. And then uh, everything seems to be going fine. Everything is great. And all of a sudden, 30 people decide to get up and, and you didn't even know it. Every, you think everything is good. And all of a sudden, you didn't know that all these people over here were talking to one another behind your back. And the next thing you know, one Sunday, they're not there. And when you call them up, they're hateful. They're mad. And they say, we're not coming back. And here's what they say. God has uh, told us that move on. And, and then they're mean and they start and you feel rejection. And there's a desolate feeling a desolate place when you're in rejection. Number two, it could fe- become a very lonely place. Rejection can make you feel, feel very lonely when people reject you. Pastors watching me, listen to me. People, the ministry is one of the worst places to be in ministry or in business or as a vocation because it is a place where you'll spend 50% of your time questioning your calling because of rejection. Because people are mean. People are mean. And people think when they're done with you, God's done with you. And people judge people. And when they don't stack up to their opinion, they reject them. It's a lonely place. I've been many a times riding around crying to God because of rejection of people. I know, and, and, and you have to learn uh, that if you're in a business and you're in a sales business and you're starting to succeed, all the people in the break room, Jeremy, that hung out with you, they all were your friends until your check started getting bigger than theirs, your commission check. And all of a sudden, they start now whispering behind your back. They start rejecting you. Now you're in a lonely place. And now you have to be very careful because if you're living for the approval of men, you'll miss your promotion. If you're living for the approval of men, you'll miss your increase season because of rejection. Rejection is a hard place to be because we nobody wants to be what? Rejected. Nobody. And you're going to have to know if you don't know you, you will become the puppet of someone else's opinion. Oh, y'all didn't get that. Let's go over here and talk. If you don't have a confidence in you, let me tell you something how this works. You want to talk about a hard place? If you don't know you, you become the puppet of other people's opinions. And because you're living for the approval of men, you become the puppet of your actions and you only do what you think they would be okay with and you don't live your life, you're now enslaved to their opinions. You never succeed, Donald Trump or none of them. Donald Trump wouldn't be a billionaire if he lifts into the opinions of everybody else, would he? Or Warren Buffett or anybody. If you read any success book, and I read a lot of them, if you read any books about people that have built great things in history, all of them, they all, Napoleon Hill, Think and Grow Rich, people, Sam Walton who built Walmart, anybody who has wealth, had to weather rejection. And if you don't weather it and you don't build an identity and an assurity within yourself and a confidence in who you are, then you're always going to placate to the voice of others. And here's the problem. Everybody has an opinion on how you ought to do it. Everybody. 
In a world like today, everybody has a thought on how you ought to preach it, how you ought to write it. People will tell me how I ought to write a book, my book. You ought to write this. I said, well, go write your own. I wrote this one. People come on my Facebook. If you don't like me on Facebook, don't like what I'm saying, go to somebody else's Facebook. People come on my Periscope. I mean, they know it says preacher on it. They get on my Periscope and just start cussing me out, saying all this bad stuff. And I'm thinking, if, if you don't like what I'm saying, go to somebody else's. No, but they're trying to get their voice in your head because if it gets in your head, the distraction becomes an attraction to your failure. Now, for what a title of the message, don't let the distraction become an attraction. Because then you're so focused on the distraction, you become so attracted to it, it ends up becoming a destruction <laughs> in your life. Rejection. It's a hard place. It's a lonely place. It's a desolate place. Number three, it's a hard place. It's very hard to beat, to weather rejection. Number four, it's a very frustrating place. These are the places that rejection drives you. And if you can't get through hard and lonely and uh, frustrating and um, desolate, then you'll always be running to the wrong voice. I see it in relationships. I see it in marriages. I see if a, if a husband is uh, uh, so worried about making sure his wife is always overly happy and she's the, a dominant woman that uh, she mistreats him and has an attitude with him and he's not confident, then he doesn't become who he is. He just keeps placating to her and now she's controlling him. He's not happy and she thinks he's okay. And the whole reason is, is that he so doesn't want to feel rejection, he doesn't know how to be his own man. And what he needs to be to understand is that there's nothing in your wife that's going to complete you. And there's nothing in him that's going to complete her. But together in Christ, they're both completed. And you have to understand, they're different. There's difference between me and Marianne. Oh, there's a lot of difference between us. Sometimes we look at each other and say, why did we get married? There's so much difference in us. But that doesn't make, that's not a bad thing if you're mature enough to layer it where it's supposed to be layered. So I don't want to waver out my identity. She doesn't want to change, I don't want to change her identity because in Christ we're growing in our identities. But you got to face rejection. Now I was a person, I'm, I was a person that was heavily needing reject, uh, uh, acceptance, affirmation. And I was so heavily in the need of affirmation that I put my wife in a prison of not being able to be what real with her feelings because if she was not feeling like affirming me, then I picked it up as she didn't love me. And then I traced that into everything I did so that everything I did I was doing for the approval of someone else. You, you listening to me? It's a hard place, a desolate place, a lonely place, and I had to go through it, but I found out that it's also the God place because God uses these places to train the real you. Hallelujah. How many of you have been in a desolate a place where you felt desolate in a home? Or, or How many of you have experienced rejection in any of these areas of your life? It, you can feel rejection in the loss of a loved one. You can go through all four of these places. The frustration of why me? How come I'm going through this? The hard place of going home alone again and, no, and, and what you're used to, sitting at a table and there's nobody there, looking at every. I mean, that's a hard place. The, the lonely place of going to bed where your spouse used to be you, or, or a mom that used to call you. So in any area of your life, these areas that are hard places, desolate places, frustrating places are the very place you'll find God. Because they're also a God place. Because in these areas is when you'll begin to discover the real you and the real God. Not a church God, the real God. Not a Baptist God, not a Methodist God, not a Assembly God God. The real God, the God 
that comes to the desolate, hard, lonely place of frustration and train you how to get through it. Hallelujah. The three major mountains of God in the Bible, the three major mountains. Every man of God I know in the Bible had to go through rejection, go through a season where he had to walk alone. And every mountain, there's three major mountains in, in the Bible that God did. Mount Horeb, Mount Moriah, and Mount Sinai. Mount Horeb, Mount Moriah, Mount Sinai. Three major mountains. Mount Horeb, Mount Sinai, and what was the other one? Mount Moriah. Now, I want to I tell you something. These mountains, these mountains are incredible. Mount Horeb, the mountain of God. Mount Moriah, Mount Sinai. They mean certain things. Mount Horeb means the mountain of desolation. When God showed up on Mount Horeb, the people always seemed to be in a dry place. A de- Moses was rejected by Pharaoh. Moses had lost. He was raised as an Egyptian. He was raised in palace. He was raised in wealth. He wasn't raised in slavery. But when he stood up for what he believed in, he was exiled out of Egypt. And in uh, uh, he, was, he found himself in uh, Midian. And in Midian, he was there tending sheep. And the Bible said a, fly, a flame came down and consumed a bush, Mount Horeb, and it was in Moses' season of rejection that God showed up at Mount Horeb. Mount Horeb means a dry, desert place. Where was God's power? In a dry, desolate place. Mount Moriah means the mountain of distraction or and, 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 the, and Mount what was the last mount? Sinai is where God gave the law, means uncertainty. So where were all three mountains that God spoke from and visited people from were the mountains where it was hard, uncertain, and frustrating. It is in that place, it is in that place where God begins to pull the real you out. And here's few people want to stop long enough and be hard and alone to let God pull the real them out. Who hallelujah. Somebody say hallelujah. hallelujah. I'd rather you be single and be alone than be in a relationship and be miserable. Anybody know what I'm talking about? If you know what I'm talking about, say amen. Now, David, David, Led through rejection. David becomes a giant killer, but then he has to become king. And look at what, look, I was going through the Bible. Let me show you David's life. Number one, rejected by his father. Number two, rejected by his brothers. First of all, he's not, he's he's not called to the dinner table to get blessed by the priest, by, by the prophet. He's rejected by his father. Then he goes to the battlefield under the instruction of the father, and his brothers reject him. So now his brothers reject him, and his father rejects him. He kills Goliath, and King Saul lets him in the house. But as soon as Saul gets him close to him, the Bible said Saul rejects him. So the, Saul rejects him. The brothers reject him. The father reject, rejects him. Then he marries the king's daughter, and the Bible said she rejects him. She despises him. So his wife rejected him. Then two of his sons, one of them was Absalom, tried to take his kingdom, and they rejected him. His best friend, Ahithophel, rejected him. However, he is mightily anointed by God. He is mightily anointed by God, which tells me that the more the world starts hating you might be a clue to how much God is starting to favor you. And that the anointing in you, as much as it's drawing the power of God, is also drawing the rejection of men. And let me tell you something. The art of rejection and the rejection of art, two kinds of rejections. The art of rejection is when we reject your appearance. 
It's about appearance-oriented rejection. It is where the immature mind lives. We learn it on the playground. We started adapting to this world view of accepting people by their stature. We did it when we saw people and they didn't throw the ball real good or they didn't talk real good or they didn't run real good. And, and we're, it's, we learned it playing volleyball, play out in recess, uh, playing uh, football, where we're, we're going to break up into teams. When we start dividing into teams, we start teaching the art of rejection. We start picking sides and We'll pick captains first. I'll say, Rico, you're a captain, and then uh, Richie, you're a captain. You, you ever done this? And then R R Rico stands over there, and Richie stands over here, and there's 20 of us on the playground, and we're all standing in the middle, and they're going, pick me, pick me. Y'all ever seen this? And Rico says, uh, mm, I'll take him because he knows he looked like a good runner. I'll take him. And then and then Richie goes, mm, I'll, I'll take him I'll right here because he knew he could throw the ball real good. And, and they're, pat they're trying to size up their team. You know what I'm talking about? But then all of a sudden we get down to the last two or three. And we know they can't run. They can't throw. They're little puny guys or girls, right? And here's how they get picked. You take her, I'll take him. Let's go. <laughs> and immediately those two people just felt the art of rejection. Because... They don't know what they can do, but they assume by their stature they're no good. This is where racism's birthed from. Where we look at the color of somebody and we start assessing their value by their appearance. This is why the country is in a mess right now because it's divided into teams. And now we're not trying to build America. We're trying to pick a team. And we got the art of rejection in this whole uh, presidential thing. And we're measuring everybody. And we really don't know none of them. And the immature mind lives in the art of rejection. Gets offended in the art of rejection. Don't know never spent a day with any of the guys running for president and you talk on Facebook like you're sitting down eating dinner with them. And David knew the art of rejection because the Bible said when David was born, he was redheaded. And we know G he was like a redheaded, uh, he wasn't very tall, he wasn't very strong. And everybody else in Jesse's home had black hair. And they all knew David ain't like us. And then they found out that David's daddy, Jesse, had cheated on his mom because David made a big comment in Psalms when he said, God, I can't believe you've called me in, as a king. You know I was conceived in iniquity. You know that I am the red-headed stepkid in this house. You know my daddy don't honor me. You know my brothers don't respect me. But I want you to know, when men are rejecting you, it's probably at the same time God is accepting you. Yeah. Hallelujah. If you will understand that God's going to use rejection as the scalpel as a surgeon uses to cut out the luster and praise of men so you only live for the praise of God. I don't want to be like everybody. Tell somebody, I don't want to be like everybody else. I don't want to act like everybody. I don't want to please you. I want to please the Father. David didn't look like a king. He didn't act like a king. He didn't walk like a king. He didn't throw like a king. He didn't talk like a king. He didn't look like uh, Abinadab. He didn't look like Eliab. He didn't look like none of them. They looked like kings, walked like kings, talked like kings, smelt like kings. He looked like a shepherd boy, walked like a shepherd boy, smelt like the sheep that he was shepherding. And so when they saw, the Bible said that when Samuel saw him, he cringed. He was working the art of rejection. Here's Samuel. Seriously? I know. He saw him coming. He said, ain't no way. He, I know Samuel. Samuel looked and said, ain't no way. He's the king chosen by God. Look at him. 
He don't even look like a king. Saul, the Bible says Saul was a head taller than every man. Saul was kingly in appearance. He was not kingly in character. David is walking up and Samuel himself is working the yard of rejection. There's no way. But the Bible said as soon as the horn that the oil of God was in saw him in a distance, the horn starts dripping. The oil became so dense and heavy as he started walking in. The oil, the anointing in the horn began to feel the attraction to the man. It don't matter if men don't see your value if the oil knows your value. And the more you know who you are, David walks up and the oil begins to wait up in the horn and say, that's me. Put me on him. He is the one God has favored. And he works the art of rejection. And then here comes Saul. The Bible said that David kills Goliath. And, and boy, Saul, immediately Saul receives David. Saul does something that David hasn't experienced yet. Saul brings him in. Saul calls him son. The Bible said Saul brought him in, started acting like he was one of his sons. And Jonathan and David, Saul's son, became best friends. And David is now sitting at the table with King Saul. And they're talking about killing. And, and David starts going out to battle every day with Saul and go to fight and build and build a relationship that he's never had with his father. He gets with Saul. But all of a sudden one day they're riding their horses in and they're singing songs on the walls. The women are and they start singing Saul kills his thousands but David kills ten thousand. They start singing about Saul and David but they start talking about David's content. They start talking about David's gifting and they say Saul he's killed his thousands but David has killed his tens of thousands and the Bible said one day Saul heard what they were saying and the acceptance in Saul for David shifts and Saul begins to hate David that's the rejection of art the art of rejection is when I reject your appearance. That's the easy battle. It's when you grow up and your gifting starts leaking. Your assignment, your difference starts happening. And now people that pull you in start seeing that your anointing is greater than theirs. And instead of mentoring you for your season, they plot to kill you in your absence. It happens all the time in church. You do it in the coffee shop. You do it in your car on the way home. You put somebody in your crosshairs and you tear them apart because their content got revealed. Now the battle for success is not how you survive the art of rejection. The battle for success is how you survive the rejection of your gifting. Because David's battle wasn't Goliath. Everybody says David's battle was Goliath. Goliath was the easiest of David's tests. The big test is can you survive and outlast the season of your mentor hating your gift. Can you stay true to your calling and still be living in desolate, lonely places? Can you believe in your destiny when men are rejecting your gifting? That's the power of success. Can you go, and, and, and what people don't know this, Saul reigns 20 years. David hid in caves for 20 years with a call to be king on his life. And can you maintain your respect and honor 
while waiting on God's timing for your promotion. Because David has to stay in his faith while he's living in a desolate, hard, frustrating, lonely place. But it's in that place where he learns who God really is. Twice God tests David. Twice. Twice God wanted to see if David was going to placate to the praise of men and get his position without God's help. Twice. He put David and Saul in the place where David could have killed him while Saul was sleeping. One time... Saul was in a cave sleeping, and the guard fell asleep. David came down the cave, walks in past the guards, picks Saul's sword up, holds it up to cut his head off, but then takes the sword, doesn't cut his head off, and he leaves. And then the next day, he stands on a cliff, and Saul was there, And David yelled and said, Saul, why are you after me? And and Abner, who was guarding the king, yells back at David and says, How dare you defile your king and yell down from an elevated place? Acting very honorable. And David said, How dare you guard my king and let his enemy in? kill him and Abner said it's a lie he said oh really and David threw Saul's sword down at Saul's feet and said Saul God has delivered you into my hands three times but I have not taken your life because of your anointing Now, that's how you survive rejection. You don't let how others treat you decide how you're going to treat them. Oh, y'all don't want to talk now. I did all that to set you up. You can't let others decide your reaction. It's a test. It's a test. Look at somebody say, it's a test. You going to pass it? Are you going to pass it? Interesting thoughts. I'm going to let you go. Interesting thought. Interesting. Now, you got the message, right? You can't let people decide how you treat them. You treat them according to the Word of God. It's a test. Interesting. I, was re- I wrote this down, and I want to give it to you. When God destines a believer for extraordinary influence in the body of Christ. This is interesting to me. He prepares him or her through the rejection of people. Interesting to me that everybody in the Bible that God decided to anoint to do extraordinary things, every one of them, he had to prepare them through being rejected from people. He used it As a means for preparation. Even his own son went through rejection. It appears to me that rejection is one of God's specialty tools for training. We don't talk about it enough. But it it seems to me by reading the Bible... That rejection is one of God's specialty tools in the school of training. It's a tool he uses to train us. When great anointing is on you, expect an overdose of rejection around you. And know that God's using it as a training tool for your future. So I thought, this is interesting to me. Why? My question was, why? Why would you use? Joseph went through it. As soon, Joseph's brothers, they played, they hung out until 
daddy put the coat of many colors on one of them. And as soon as one of them got the focus of father, the others rejected him. It happens. It's, you'd think that siblings would, would rejoice over the promotion of, of their brother, wouldn't it? I mean, it's their brother. Well, but there's always this competitiveness in people. We're sinners by heart. We're sinners by nature. You know that, right? Ain't none of us righteous. You understand that? Y'all ain't righteous. Don't even act like it. None of us are righteous. The Bible said the, the intent of a heart, the man's heart is evil above all things. If God didn't walk with you, you would do the most evilest things. Why would he use rejection as a tool for training? Why? I asked God, why? He said, I'm glad you asked. I'll tell you why. This is why. So that he can flush out and make sure that people aren't your focus, but God is. Because there will come a place where you will only be able to do it with God. You've got to be willing to go through your training. People who can't weather rejection or weather that hard, drought, dry, lonely place will jump in another wrong relationship and then another one and then another one and then another one because they're men-focused or women-focused and not God-focused. God is, the Bible said, God is, a, and I want you to hear me, God is a jealous God. The Bible said that God set his love upon you with a jealous love. Listen to me. Look at somebody and say this. God set his love on you with a jealous love. You need to go read that. He said, I love you with a jealous. He said, let me tell you what kind of husband I am. I'm a jealous husband. I don't want you to love anything more than me. Not your children, not your job, not your wife, not your career, not your comfort. I love you with a jealous love that if I see you cheating on me, there's consequence. And so he uses rejection to flood out of his people, not to be men-focused but to be God-focused. I want to give you a key here. The more you hate the world, and I'm talking about a system, not people, the more you hate the world, the more God likes you. Whew. Look at somebody say that. The more you hate the world, come on, Jeremy, the more God likes you. Listen, look, look. We talk about loving the cross we don't ever talk about hate, do we? We don't ever talk about hate in the kingdom. We talk about love, love, love. Let me tell you what you need to hate. You need to hate evil. Y'all didn't hear me. You want to stop sinning? Hate evil. Don't just love God. You need to act like evil is the partisan you ain't voting for because that's how y'all act right now. If you act like that with sin, you would never sin. You need to hate evil. There needs to be a hatred in you for ungodly. Now, I'm not talking about trying to be somebody else's God, and I'm going to tell Melissa my convictions or her convictions or my con No, no, no. The Bible said each man works out his own salvation with fear and trembling. That way we can process with one another because I'm, I might be here, you might be here in the walk, and I can walk with you because you're working your walk in process as I'm working mine in process. But I got to hate evil, and they got to hate evil, and if you just start out, you got to hate evil. And the more you build a hate for the ungodly, the more godly you become. And God uses rejection to get all that out of us. I wrote down this last thought. The Lord is doing a surgery. I asked the Lord, what's going on? He said, I'm not done. I'm not done. I've listened to preacher after preacher, and I hear them saying God's not done with America. 
there's still something God's going to do with us. Before he comes, God's not done with this country nor of this remnant. And I said, what are you doing? And this is what he said. He said, the Lord, the, the Spirit said, the Lord is doing surgery in the heart and lives of his people. And he's removing from us the mechanism that desires the recognition of men more than God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You're in surgery. You're in rejection right now. You're going through a crisis. You're in surgery. You know what surgery God's going to show you? That he's going to remove whatever desire is in you for the recognition of people that is greater than you wanting to be recognized by God. I don't want to live life without God. I don't want to be successful and have it and succeed and God not go with me. I don't want to be a good dad. I want to be a godly good dad. Some of you are good men. Somebody's watching me or sitting here. You're a good man. You got good heart. You have good ways. You treat people kindly and good, but that doesn't mean you're godly. And you know you can be good and go to hell. Hell's full of good people. Hell, the road to hell is paved with good intentions there's men in the graveyard that were good men and good fathers and good workers good church attenders don't make you godly you know what makes us godly when we start living for the approval of God and make it greater than the approval of men when we start doing that we become godly and when we walk in kingdom godliness the wealth of heaven becomes our storehouse. How many would like to shop God's bank? Y'all don't want to talk tonight. How many want to shop God? How many would like to go up to God's bank and shop? You go down here to Community One, you're only getting what you put in it. And some of you, it ain't very much. But if you get to God's bank, He said you can get where you didn't even sow. I got blessings that you didn't even sow for in my bank. You're going to pull up to God's drive through and he's going to say, oh, yeah, you're kingly. Yeah, yeah, what you need? Just tell me. I'll meet your need according to my bank, not yours. Hallelujah. Don't be good and not be godly. Don't. Jesus is coming. Hell is waiting, and so is heaven. Don't be a good man or a good woman, a good mom, a good dad, a good person, and a good, 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 and never follow and fall in love with God. And you can't fall in love with God, look up here and put it on camera, without Jesus. The cross has to be the door to God. Ain't no other door. I don't care what anybody tells you. I don't care what CNN says. They don't even know God. Fox News don't know God. You know that, right? You know TV is not godly. They're trying to show you now that two men can raise children and they call it normal living. Ain't no normal living with two men raising a man or two women raising a kid. It's not normal. Now, do I hate them? No. Can I help them? Yes. But I'm not going to look them in the face and say, I'm not going to tell them kids, this is, this is a normal, what God intended family. This is not what God intended. This is what you want. This is not God's intention. Don't be good and miss God. Okay? Rejection is going to happen all your life. Don't chase the approval of men and miss the approval of God. Better to go to bed alone tonight and be, and be lonely and please God than to have someone in the bed with you and made you ungodly. See what I'm saying? And that could be anything from a person to a sin life or whatever. Just make God your focus. My prayer in my life right now is help me to discern difference on the earth. That's wisdom. Wisdom is to discern difference. Different in a moment, different in a season, different in people, different in a crisis. Let me discern. How many would like to discern difference in a moment? I was at the house the other day, and I, I was going to go up to my TV room. I have my iPad and my little phone because I like to go up there. I'm going to go. I'm going to, I'm going to regress to the room because I like to cave out, right? Veg out. And 
I was walking and Roro was saying something to me. And I was just going to leave. But I've been praying, God, give me wisdom to discern what? A moment. So I put the thing on the, on the counter and I start playing. We, first, we're gonna, we start dancing. I know she likes to dance, right? When we're gonna, we, she likes king, queen stuff, right? Prince, I mean, she can name them all. Ariel, I mean, all of them, right? So we start playing and I, we're at the door and now we're acting like people are coming in. So I, oh, somebody's at the door. We're opening the front door of my house now. People walking by, they thought we was just crazy. I open the front door and I go, oh! And she's standing there, look. I say, it's the king of Granite Falls. She says, come in, king. I'm the queen. She does her little bow. I'm the queen of Lawson's Creek. And we're playing like that. I mean, really, if you watch us, you think they're smoking dope. That man's smoking dope. But you know what? You know what I did? I, I used to would miss those moments. You see what I'm saying? But I've been praying, God, give me wisdom, discern difference in a moment. You know? And by doing that, I can tell, you know, because she used to be kind of like, don't want to talk to Papa. She wants Nani, Nani. And I'm in this competition to beat Nani out. Because it's, you know, it's nonny, nonny this, nonny, nonny that. And I say, you want Papa? Nonny. If I kiss her, she goes, ah, you just took Nonny's kisses. And she finds Nonny in the house. He took your kisses. <laughs> I'm going to show her Papa's, Papa's somebody better than Nonny. <laughs> but you're not going to do that if you miss a moment. So how many would pray this prayer and say, Lord, I'm, I'm going to discern a moment the difference say this prayer with me say father help me have wisdom to discern the difference in a moment the difference in anything in a in a person in a season in Jesus name in Jesus name amen you're overcoming that rejection tonight you're going to overcome it you're going to overcome it I know, man, how many of you, honestly, before we go, how many of you felt that hour, that jumping the clock ahead has messed with you? It's messed with me. Is it messed with y'all? That one hour is killing me. I'm telling you, I don't know what's up with it. But I feel completely out of whack like I'm in time zone warp or something. Let's rebuke that right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, I rebuke this right now in the name of Jesus. I'm tired of feeling on the time warp. You feeling it? That hour missing you or something? I was up at 5.20 a.m. the other night. And I'm tell you what. Uh, how you doing, Devontae? I was, at, uh, look, I, was, I was up at 5.20, and I texted one of my pastor friends, and I said, man, I'm up praying for you. He said, he texted me back about 10 o'clock in the morning. He said, my God, what kind of sin is in my life? Got another man that got up at 5.20 a.m. to pray for me. <laughs> I said, I can't tell you. God said, you're going to figure it out. He said, oh, you better tell me right now. I said, no, I wasn't like that, man. Stand to your feet, hug somebody, bless somebody. Let's go home tonight. Let's get ready for Sunday. It's going to be incredibly awesome. I will be here, and we will be preaching, getting ready for Easter. Sunday is Palm Sunday. Isn't Sunday Palm Sunday? Sunday's Palm Sunday, week before crucifixion. Hug somebody, bless somebody. Bless. If you haven't sowed your seed, you can sow it tonight. If you miss the offering plate, Make sure you sow seed. Your seed decides your harvest. Nothing else. Your seed. You want more? Then start sowing. You want continuous harvest? Then have a continuous life of sowing. Watch God change your financial status with the seed that left your hand. It doesn't leave your hand, people. It goes to heaven. It multiplies. It goes to your future where it returns into your now and changes your financial status. We love you. We're glad you're a part. Get our shirts, favor, in Jesus' name. Take us away, Jeremy.